Hi, welcome to the Noise Path. In this episode, I wanted to take a look at one of these electronic COVID-19 home tests that you can buy. This particular one connects to your phone and it tells you on your phone whether you have COVID or not. Now, the way to use it is very similar to a PCR test. Now, these are not, of course, PCR-based ones. These are antigen-based ones. In a PCR test, you have this DNA replication process done through a very careful thermocycle and then use your fluorescence to read it. Now, these antigen-based ones are protein sensitivities and they essentially have a dye that attaches and then some lines appear, kind of similar to a pregnancy test. So I got two of these uh, because I wanted to see if I have COVID or not, but going back to university for teaching, it's a long story, but both of them came back positive. So you can imagine that sent me down a path of uh, doing quarantining and then going to the doctor to get tested. Well, I actually don't have COVID. So both of these were false positives. Now, false positives are not as bad as false negatives. False negatives can be quite dangerous, both for your family and for the community, of course. But a false positive is still hugely inconvenient. And it, since then, Illum has uh, given some kind of a voluntary callback of these things because they're apparently generating far too much false positive on a particular batch. I also did one of these. This is essentially exactly the same test, antigen base. And if there's two lines, you kind of have COVID. And if there's one line, you don't. And I used this afterwards. And this one, of course, came back negative. Now, I'm more interested in figuring out how does this instrument read this? Because I think the mechanism is exactly the same. And all this little thing is doing is reading whether there is one line or two line, and then connects through Bluetooth to your phone. So it must be very simple in theory. But I wanted to open it up and take a look at it. Again, this is not an opinion on the medical procedure you should follow. You should listen to your doctors. I am a doctor, but not the right kind. I have a PhD, not an MD. So this is not a medical video at all. It's more on the electronic side. So let's take a look. So let's see what we have here. It was actually quite easy to open, just plastic tabs holding it together. Let's remove it. Okay, there's the bottom. And there it is. Look at that. It looks nice. So we do have a coin cell battery in there, which kind of makes sense. It's the, probably the cheapest and fastest way to get a hold of a large number of them. There is an interesting little cutout at the bottom, perhaps in order to make sure that it stays dry inside. And let's see what we have here now. All right, pretty cool. So on this side is where you drop in the sample and of course the activation and as well as your own sample mixed in with it. I wonder what this is. I wonder if this could be for attracting moisture. It cer certainly feels like it in order to make sure it stays completely dry. I'll put this aside. We can take the battery out as well. There we go. Very cool. We should be able to take this apart a little bit further. So this is obviously where the strip would probably be and this must be coming separately. Yeah, there we go. That makes sense because they would assemble these afterwards. This is the part with the agent. There we go. There it is. Look at that. Wow. There's actually a lot of optics in there. Fascinating. Yeah, we should take a closer look at this. And here's the electronic. So unsurprisingly, we have a whole bunch of different detectors and LEDs in here. So there's two groups of them and it looks like they join in in two sections. There we go. That makes that makes sense. I think this is for the reference to ensure that the test is being done correctly. So I think what happens is when you drop in the sample, as with any other ones, the original one that I showed you, for example, this one, if you don't see the control line, the test has been done incorrectly. So this is a good way to ensure that the dye is there and then the fluid has been wicked in there and then everything is working kind of correctly. You can see the, the difference between them. So I'm assuming that exactly the same thing is happening here. And I'm sure we can open this a little bit further. This is used now, so you can see a bit of the line. It's been used a long time ago, so it's completely dry now. And sometimes the lines disappear when these things are left alone for a long time, even if they come back positive. They're only valid for like 15 minutes or so. So we should be able to remove this as well. And I bet we can power it on ourselves and see if any of those LEDs actually turn on. Now, I imagine that the way this is designed is probably to ensure that you can only use it one, once. So there must be some EEPROM in there where the result is written. And then once it's written, it's registered as used. And I'm sure there's some database in the cloud that keeps track of the different serial numbers so that no test can be used twice. So I don't think connecting it to the phone really makes much more sense. It's going to be difficult to take this off on camera. So here's the board outside. We can see some pads in here, probably for factory programming or testing, but there's quite a few more on the other side for a bed of nails tester. These are obviously go have to go through rigid testing to make sure that all the electronics are okay and that also the appropriate serial number and everything's programmed in there before they leave the factory. These two traces interface with this, that's our button, just to turn it on and off, quite simple, straightforward. There's nothing else on here, nothing in the back to reduce the cost, of course, and even the LED for the Bluetooth peaks on through the other side. So there's li literally nothing on the other side of the board. Again, we know why, because it's much more expensive to put components on two sides versus one. 
So there's a lot of LEDs in here, and these different ones obviously interface with different places of this. And I think that this thing opens up further. We should be able to remove this strip, I think. I think this looks like it's in two pieces. Let me see, can I remove this? I think you should be able to remove it. Oh, there we go. I got it. There it is. Oh, look at that. There's our strip. So if the, you drop the liquid on this side, you should be able to see the lines on the other side. Does this come off? Oh, yep, it does. There we go. Interesting. So this one does have two lines on it. I wonder if that's the positive nature of it, but that's unusual because it lines up with these two. So does that mean that these are the results and this entire section is some kind of a control or the monitoring of the fluid coming up? Seems like a lot of optics for that. At the end, there's a sponge in here, which I assume just wicks away the, any excess fluid so it doesn't get on the electronics. Interesting. So these lenses are actually direction, so they're pointing away in a certain way. Oops, I think this is just so that when you put light in here, it shines in a certain direction. Hmm, interesting. I think this might be just to make sure that the dye is moving in this direction. Maybe that's what it's monitoring. That's a lot of hardware. Interesting. But of course, because you're not looking at it, you really need to be sure that it is done correctly. Nonetheless, I think we should look at these things a little bit more under the microscope and identify some of these components that are in here, especially this chip. So let's see what we have here. At the heart of it, there is a Nordic N52810. This is a, a fairly complex SOC. It has Bluetooth low energy in it. It has a 32-bit um, Cortex uh, processor in it that runs at 64 megahertz. It probably explains the 32 megahertz crystal we see here. ADCs and IR controls and so many other things are on here. It's a bit of an overkill, I think. And then there is our antenna right there. This looks like some kind of an inductor for the matching network. Here's a shunt cap there, and that is our antenna trace. It's going to be barely, barely visible on camera because of the black silk screen. And then that's it. Not much else. There's a bunch of passives there. Then we got two LEDs here and a detector in the center. Now, these LEDs, I don't think, are what is reading the actual result. It looks like that they perhaps monitor that the dye is progressing throughout the strip because as it, gets, as it gets wicked away there is kind of a forefront of dye that moves forward and I think this is what it's reading to make sure that it is actually happening so that the results are going to be correct that's my guess there and if you go further we see a trio of components again so we have two transmitters here these are two LEDs and a detector and I think this is what's actually reading the, the final result but please correct me if you know otherwise a bunch of other passives most likely just transistors things to turn on and off uh, the LEDs and so on, and here's the pads for the battery. Yeah, I think it's really, really simple. Otherwise, and I think the structure is, is very similar to one of those electronic pregnancy test readers, except that the electronic preg pregnancy test ones do not have this portion. I think this is an extra step because of the importance of a test like this, I think. So yeah, pretty cool. We should take a look at the optics for a second. So here's the optics from the side of the LEDs. So this is where the LEDs shine into. I think there's two bigger white LEDs that you saw shine over here and here, and these two lenses focus the result back onto the detector. Now everything is here in an angle. So if I look the other side, this is the side that faces the, the actual strip. You can see the nature of the angled parts there in order to make sure that everything is kind of focused on the right spot. And as the die, for example, would move forward, I think it just it, you can read whether it has progressed or not. Again, that's just my guess, but that kind of makes sense. And these holes line up with the lines on the strip. Here's the other one, actually, because I had two of them. And interestingly, on this one, there's only one line. The other one does not show up. So this one, either the line disappeared over time or maybe something else is going on. But yeah, that kind of makes sense. What is going on in terms of its design now? A lot of custom molded pieces and so on. And clear optics are even more expensive, of course, because everything's plastic nonetheless. I think we should turn it on and see if any of those LEDs light up at all and how much current it draws. And here it is connected to my Rodentrois power supply, 3.3 volts. It's basically drawing nothing. That negative number is basically the offset of the power supply that it has. So we're going to go ahead and try it, turn it on and see if any of these LEDs flash. So let's see if I can turn this on using this metal piece here. Wow, look at that. That was pretty cool. Let's try that one more time. Reset the power supply. One more try so we can see the color of those LEDs again. Yeah, very neat. So we've got blue and red. That's interesting. So if the red is for detection, detecting blue strips after the test is done makes sense because you can affect the reflection of the white surface if there's a blue line on it using a red LED. These are at opposite ends of the spectrum, optical spectrum visibly at least. 
and then you can read it with this. There's an isolation between these, so they don't you know, kind of interfere with each other. These blue ones could be to measure the progression of the ink as it goes through the dye, and that dye is probably blue as it moves around, or it could even be red as it moves around. On the other test, uh, they start as blue and they turn into red, and maybe this one is opposite. And then you can see again using these two and this detector. That's just my guess, and I think this is not flashing because it's waiting for a connection to a phone. Yeah, very neat. So I think that's how it works, but please let me know in the comment section if you know otherwise. So yeah, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this little video in case you were ever wondering what's inside one of these. Personally, I think the electronic version of these tests is an enormous waste. These things are one time use. You have to throw away all of these after you've tested it. It's just crazy the amount of waste this thing produces. You know, we do have a perfectly good instrument to read these already. I don't know why we need to have something so complicated. You can always enter your result into the phone. You can even take a picture of something like this and have the image analyzed on your phone. I don't know why you need this complication. But anyway, nonetheless, we learned a couple of things by looking at the electronics. I'll see you next time.